Good morning and welcome to this webinar on maximising your fundraising. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Rebuilding Heritage Programme, which is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund under the Business Support Programme. I'm Sarah Murray. I'm the Project Manager on the Heritage Alliance's Rebuilding Heritage Programme. A little bit of housekeeping for you before we begin. Audience members, your camera cameras and microphones will be switched off throughout. Today's session will start with a presentation and we've allowed plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So please do add your questions into the Q&A box. The chat is switched on today, so say hello, interact with your fellow attendees and let us know about any tech issues. We do have live captioning today, which can be switched on via your Zoom menu. And we will be recording today's session and making it available on our website afterwards. I want to take this opportunity to share a little bit with you about the programme. Rebuilding Heritage provides training and support for the sector to help heritage professionals and heritage organisations respond to the challenges of COVID-19. We're offering free resources such as this webinar, which will be openly available online. We also have one-to-one -one and group support, which you can access by application. As of 8am this morning, we are open for applications for round two of support, which will be delivered in January and February 2021. Full details are available on our website at rebuildingheritage.org.uk. The deadline for applications for this round is 11pm on the 16th of December. The application is quite short. We estimate it should take you about 20 to 30 minutes to complete. And you can express interest in just one, several or all types of support that are available. In January and February, we'll be offering heritage organisations, including voluntary bodies and sole traders, access to up to eight hours of business planning consultancy with Created United, a media and communication strategy session, session and follow-up support session with Media Trust, fundraising consultancy with the Chartered Institute of Fundraising, a place on rebuilding leadership training with Claw Leadership, and new for this round, a place on managing well-being training. Please do apply. We are keen to hear from you all. You can also now follow us on Twitter at heritage underscore rh and please do use the hashtag rebuilding heritage and we will uh, be able to chat to you that way too so without further ado we are on to the session itself i am delighted to introduce you to jill jolly of achieve consultants on behalf of the chartered institute of fundraising over to you jill Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. And also big thanks, we've got Vanessa also watching uh, the chat and the Q&A uh, boxes as well. So thank you to you both. I'm delighted to be with you here today because I've got a, a real passion about heritage. I've been working as a consultant for a number of years now, but uh, as a new graduate came into professional fundraising over 30 years ago. And I've worked as a fundraiser, a manager, a director and a consultant across a wide range of voluntary and community organisations. But when you actually get to see me a little bit better, uh, when we do the questions and answer session, when we come off the slides, you'll see that my office is in um, uh, my home, but it's a grade two listed building. And the bit that I'm actually sat in uh, dates back to 1450. So at times I feel like I'm the mini national trust. So I'm always very comfortable talking to anyone about Death Watch Beetle, the merits of lime plaster and all sorts of other things. So is that I'm delighted to be with you today, but also uh, uh, meeting some of you individually on the one-to-one -one sessions. So let's just sort of think about what today uh, we're going to be covering, because it is about maximising your fundraising. And it's really interesting. We've got over 150 people on the session today, which is absolutely wonderful. But as you can imagine, when you registered, you actually said uh, what, what you'd like this session to, to get out of, what, what you'd like it to cover. So you can imagine we've got lots of things that people want to get out of it. So I'm afraid we're not going to be able to do everything for everyone, but that's the benefit. We're having the webinar first with, with the, 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 the actual presentation, and then the webinar will then move over to a question and answer session. So we're going to go at some pace so that we can get through lots of different things um, and then we've got time to, to share uh, and share information. Then we've got time for questions. So we're going to start off with some background information and then we're going to move into some practical uh, uh, things, which will give you hopefully some ideas and things that you can actually uh, start to put into practice. And then we're going to end with how to take things forward before we then move in, as I say, into the question and answer session. So when we're actually sort of thinking about um, fundraising, we need to just 
do some some initial sort of planning because so often we want to dive into actually getting on with some fundraising activities but let's just take that step back and think about you know what are the first things that we need to do so first of all are we clear why we actually need money what are we going to do with it because that's an important part of what we're actually going to share with our potential donors funders supporters then we need to be able to communicate what is it that we're trying to solve what is it that we're trying to overcome what's the problem what's the issue so it might be that you say people need to know some of our background some of our history is absolutely vital it's essential that we protect uh, the, the, the living heritage of the country and increase uh, and restore biodiversity, perhaps to, to a river or some wildlife. So we need to think what is the issue that we're trying to overcome. And then one of the other key things that we're actually looking to do is understand what difference the donor's support will actually make. One of the key motivations is, is wanting to make a difference, wanting to see some change come about. So again, we need to be really clear. Whilst we don't want to necessarily restrict our income when we're actually asking for, for support, whether it's from uh, individual donors, whether it's from corporates, whether it's from statutory bodies, or whether it's from uh, corporates um, or grant making bodies, you know, um, Sometimes we have to, but overall we need to be actually sharing, you know, if someone invests in us as an organisation, what difference is going to happen? Because that's one of the key things that actually underpins. So um, uh, many of you, I'm sure, uh, know that lovely uh, poem uh, from Rudyard Kipling's Just So Stories, published in 1902. I know six honest serving men. They taught me all I know. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. So that what, why, when, how, where and who are really, really useful things to actually think about before you start fundraising. So you could actually answer those questions. So when you start communicating with your potential donors and supporters, your funders, you've got all that information to hand. So to be successful in fundraising, it is about a two-way relationship. We need to think about the supporter experience. So we need to try and understand what it is that they're looking at of their involvement. And when we come back in a, a few minutes to talk about some of the sources, we'll come back to this thread then. But in order to be successful, you say we need to ensure that our donors, our supporters, our funders are actually getting back what they're looking for out of this involvement and this relationship. So we need to understand those. And then as a result, we're going to end up with satisfied donors and supporters who will give again, give at a higher level, and then encourage other people to actually get involved. And that's a very powerful fundraising ask. When someone who's already supported us actually asks or gives a recommendation to someone else. So that can again be on a one-to-one -one basis with individuals, someone who's volunteering or giving a direct debit, or who's a member of your organization. If they say to one of their friends, yeah, I'm involved with this organization, you know, I think you should be too. And that is really powerful. And it's far better than we as fundraisers within the organization doing it. We need a mixture of the two. And again, you know, uh, if you're, you've applied to a grant making uh, body and they've been uh, supportive of you, you know, just ask that question. Is there anyone that you could introduce us to? So again, to actually get an introduction from a grant making body to another grant making body, that again can be really powerful. So just think of fundraising as when you're getting involved with it, get into the right mindset and think about asking for support. We're not actually asking for money. We're actually asking for help to make a change come about. We're also giving people the opportunity to get involved with something that is incredible. Having looked at the, the organisations who run this court, you're doing some incredible, some magical things out there. And so if we don't ask people and organisations to get involved, I actually like to think of it as we're denying them that opportunity. So that's why I'm always really pleased to actually ask, ask for them to help us make a difference. 
So within fundraising, we need a plan. Uh, so often, like I said before, we just want to get involved. Let's crack on with that fundraising. And I know for many of you, I say, income streams have perhaps dried up or, or you've, uh, people have, have disappeared from the organisation if they've been on furlough. And we're so, uh, you know, really, really wanting to get cracking, but let's just do it in a strategic way. Let's have a plan, because if we have a plan, there's so many benefits from this. So I like to think of a plan as our route map. It's going to take us from where we are now to where we actually want to be. And if we don't have a plan, we won't fulfil our objectives. We won't use resources widely. We might not be able to reach our fundraising goals. And as a result, we might not be able to provide those much needed services or facilities or enable people to access the wonderful things that they're able to do if your organisation is functioning normally. So uh, having a, an overall strategy that fits it for fundraising, that fits in with your business strategy, uh, is, is a way to make sure that we're, we're actually not just thinking about the here and now, but we're thinking about the next period of time. Usually a strategy is looking at a period of three or five years. So we want to make sure our fundraising fits in with that as well. And so we think of our plan being an annual plan to deliver that overall strategy in terms of generating income, that will then enable your organisation to go on and achieve what it actually wants to do. But a plan is that monitoring tool to actually help us identify where we are now within our financial year. And I know for many of you, that is where you're saying, oh, our income's down. Or for some of you, your income may be up because you might have had emergency appeals. You might have been successful with some of the emergency funds. So let's not just think negatively all the time. There's lots of positivity. Uh, and with a name like Jolly, you're going to expect me to say that. I'm the eternal optimist. So where are we now? So what, that's our starting point. And this applies to both our funding uh, and our sources and our, the methods that we're actually using to tap into them, but also the results that we're actually getting in terms of our fundraising approaches. But also, it, where are we now? It's as important to actually think about our organisational funding needs. For many of us, those have actually changed. We're not delivering services or providing access in the way that we were before. It might mean that our fundraising or our organisational uh, expenditure has reduced. Some of you are still employed uh, and have been uh, over, over, you say, the, the summer, but perhaps were furloughed. Um, so, so again, income is coming in from a different source that when you put together your original uh, budgets, there was no such thing as the HMRC's job retention scheme. It was no income uh, line that, that we were identifying uh, back then. So just think about where are we now? Where are the gaps? And whilst we might have had a reduction for some of our income we, from some sources, we might have seen some new sources actually result in additional income coming in. But you say, uh, realistically, I think we also need to recognise, you say, whilst we might not need the same level of money that we were originally predicting, uh, we might not now be in a position to raise at that particular level. Because some of those uh, recovery programmes, you say, have actually closed, because I know the cultural recovery programme has closed a little while ago, but 455 organisations have benefited uh, from a, a lot of the money that's actually been out there. Uh, and I know, you say, looking at some of those who say Blackpool uh, Tower, that the Blackpool Ballroom uh, within there has got three quarters of a million to actually help to uh, repair their ceiling and ensure that keeps uh, in, in a good order. But they've lost income through our missions. And obviously, uh, if those of you who are keen on Strictly will realise, even though it was Blackpool Week last Saturday, they certainly didn't go up to that Lancashire seaside town to actually uh, to the home of ballroom dancing. So what we need to do is understand where our money's coming from, where it's come from already, what sources aren't actually generating income, but what new opportunities might have already opened up and we've been tapping into. We need to keep ourselves up to date, obviously with funding sources, but also what's going on in the world of fundraising and income generation. So I just want to share a, a couple of reports. Um, I'm not going to go into any great detail. I've just got a couple of highlights uh, from them uh, just to share with you now. But 
One, uh, this is normally an annual report that comes out uh, from CAF, um, Charities Aid Foundation on UK Giving. Uh, but as say they've done a, a special one that rather than leaving it to the whole year they've done a, a period they've done a, a special report covering the period from January to August and one thing that is is really interesting is it shows that there's an additional 800 million has been given to charities over the last nine months uh, but uh, then it's of no surprise that a fifth of people have reported that they've been supporting charities related to the NHS. But again, interestingly for everyone out there uh, today is cashless forms of fundraising have increased. Again, it's no surprise. Uh, even my local chippy, uh, not that I'm going there very often, but a, an occasional treat. Uh, but, you know, they're no longer taking cash and you've got to go uh, with, with your card. Um, but also, not surprisingly, sponsored activities have actually uh, significantly declined. A couple more findings just for you to have a look at, but again, um, you can go and find out a lot more detail from the report, as you say, and the link was on the previous slide and on the bottom of this slide as well. Um, but you say the number of people um, has remained very constant to the previous year who's donating to charity. Um, and he said there's a phenomenal amount of money sort of uh, knocking about out there in donations, but obviously you say it's, it's an interesting one as to where the money is actually going to at the moment. And I know there's going to definitely be some questions about how can we get more of that share later on. But also you say we've got that large and sustained increase in cashless giving. So again, we've got some thoughts to share with you later on that. But also the last one I think is really, really positive for us is that trust in charities did actually increase uh, last year, but it's increased even further since March of this year. So again, sharing with people, we are a registered charity. It's giving you that credibility and also showing um, this report is showing that the trust uh, is actually uh, very high amongst uh, charities and what's happening in the UK at the moment. So another uh, useful report, again, I, I'm not going to go into huge detail, uh, and this is with uh, the Institute of Fundraising uh, and also Blackboard. Those of you who are not familiar with, with that company, they are the people behind Razor's Edge, if that's the database you're using or have heard of, that's other organisations using, but they are also the company behind Just Giving. So again, uh, that combined with the Institute of Fundraising, again, lots of interesting findings within this report that might be helpful to inform your fundraising plan as you move forward. So again, just a couple of, of sort of quick ones, which I think actually uh, is sort of starting to direct us as to where we're going to go in terms of moving forward. But 44% of organisations uh, have been found to be willing to innovate and try new things. They've recognised some of their traditional fundraising activities just aren't working at the moment. So 44% percent of organizations when this report was compared were willing to innovate and try new things. 60% of respondents have done some form of virtual fundraising during the pandemic with over three quarters using it for the first time. So again, I think you know, there's, there's a, a, a definite direction of travel to be starting to identify here. And 64% of uh, organizations have found fu virtual fundraising a good way to actually attract uh, new supporters and every time I talk to any charity and organisation they always say how do we find new supporters we've got our existing ones we lose them every so often but we want to get some new ones so at least that is one sort of way to think about that again um, just one last slide on uh, uh, with information from this report but again i'm not going to go into huge detail here you can look at this later you can go back to that report but again uh, when organizations have been asked uh, about what do they think are the main fundraising challenges uh, within the charity sector what they're going to face over the next five years not surprisingly recovering from the financial impact of the the, the pandemic is is really high up there and the economic situation possibly leading to fewer donors is, is very much up there. But I think uh, really interesting is keeping up with the pace of technology, uh, uh, technological change. You know, 
who who this time last year knew about Zoom. I used to think it was a nice lolly, but uh, I say I definitely uh, spending a lot of my life on Zoom, and there's no ice lollies involved whatsoever. Um, another one I just want to point out here is. Um, Retaining and recruiting fundraising talent. Uh, I've just been sort of talking to, to a museum uh, locally to, to me, helping them to do some recruitment. And, and, and in fact, this morning, uh, I, I know they're actually offering the job to someone this morning, which is great news. But the person who's been in the recruiting manager says she was actually overwhelmed with the quality of people uh, applying for the job. And it wasn't out of work fundraisers, but people who wanted to move into the heritage sector and saw that as a great way forward for them. So, uh, but as I say, recruiting and retaining uh, fundraising talent may be a challenge that some of you uh, will be facing. But you say there's lots of people out there and you say it's about retaining them. But having a good fundraising plan and lots of activity is one way to do it. So let's just, as we move forward, thinking about what should be in your fundraising mix as part of that planning process before we move into those fundraising sources and methods. You know, we should be looking to have relatively low risk income streams. Uh, but at some stage, we do need to take a risk every so often. Every activity shouldn't be a risk or a high risk. Um, there's risk in all sorts of fundraising because we can never guarantee we're not making widgets. We don't put various materials into a pot and out comes a certain thing at the end. But we're looking to reduce the amount of risk and we'll come back to that theme a little bit later. We're looking for cost efficient, cost effective fundraising. So for every pound that you spend, you're getting a good return back on that. We want to do activities that are acceptable to your organisation. They need to be realistic in terms of implementation. It may be you've just got one person involved in fundraising and that's not their full time job. And again, I know we'll probably come back to questions around resources later on. And we also need a mixture of restricted income coming into the organisation as well as unrestricted. Sometimes we find it slightly easier or donors, supporters, funders want to know exactly what their money will do. Uh, and sometimes that might be more cost effective, but sometimes the, the valuable money is the unrestricted income. So if we have a balance of the two overall, it will make our fundraising income streams cost effective. So to help us with sustainability, you say our plan, our fundraising plan should have this mixed portfolio of different sources and then use different methods and techniques to actually tap into those. So what we're going to do now is spend a few minutes thinking about those sources uh, and how you can tap into those as well as then sort of spend a bit more time thinking about uh, how you might be doing different activities at the moment to tap into one of the biggest income sources for the voluntary sector. So when we're looking to put together our plan, we should be considering you say, these key income uh, streams. Money that's coming from individuals. Money but also support. Um, let's think about that widely as well because again whilst we often think we want cash there's many times that individuals or companies or, or even uh, community uh, organisations can help us in other ways as well. So don't be too tunnel vision to say I want the cash. Yes in order to actually achieve your financial goals you perhaps want to see hard cash coming into the organisation. But just think, can somebody give you something that will save you spending money that's in your expenditure budget? So it could well be you're looking to recruit uh, some, some new grounds people, a new gardener possibly. Um, and again, it may be there's people who's got time on their hand. They couldn't give you money at the moment, but they've got time on their hand. They could do that. But then just think about corporates. Again, you might be tunnel vision. Well, we just want money. But corporates have got so many things that they could do. And um, hard cash is sometimes difficult to get. But I know lots of heritage organisations are incredibly successful in getting sponsorship. So it's not just looking at philanthropic giving as we want to support organisations in our community. So here's some money we're going to give you. 
that may be coming out of a different uh, budget within their organisation. So if they're getting profile, if they're getting a link with you as an organisation, they're getting exposure to perhaps new audiences, you know, that's where the sponsorship element comes in. And again, as I say, that's a different pot of money. And lots of companies, you say, are doing well at the moment uh, and looking perhaps to give something back and get involved, but still are looking for that something back in return. Remember what we talked about at the start, you know, looking at this as a pure partnership, whatever our source of income, whether it's you say, individuals, grant makers, corporates, community, let's just think, what are they looking for out of this relationship? And ensure we're giving that back or offering that when we're actually asking them. So you say uh, our grant makers, uh, so this includes obviously uh, you know, trusts and foundations, those grant making trusts and foundations, the lottery funds and, and other grant makers out there associated perhaps with landfill and other things as well. There's new funding become available. Um, and again, there's lots of sources out there. I'm not gonna spend loads of time telling you where to go and find information. But obviously on the Heritage Alliance website, there is funding information uh, out there. And again, I'm sure lots of you are tuned in to local sources as well. I often find community action, voluntary action groups, uh, or CVSs, again, they're known by different things in different areas. They actually uh, often have got their finger on the pulse of what's happening in a locality. And obviously the community foundations that are around the country, um, either in, in counties or in regions, uh, again, whilst they've not got huge pots of money um, individually within their programmes, they often administer government funding, but also they are fund holders. They administer uh, lots of small local grant funds. Uh, and whilst it may only be up to £5,000 you're able to get from some of those, if you actually then sort of get a good relationship going with the grants officer, they often will let you know there's another pot coming up. And all of a sudden, you might have qualified for five uh, or ten different funding pots. And if they're all £5,000, that might have been 50000 that you've been able to tap into. They often they say, administer things like the High Sheriff's Award. Uh, and again, whilst there's not an awful lot of value in that, it's usually only one or two thousand pounds that you get to when you, you are one of the award winners uh, with something like that. Um, it's about uh, the, the fact you've won the award and you can share that. Uh, and again, uh, for lots of other uh, supporters, they like the thought you were an award winning organisation. So just think about what other um, awards are out there and make sure you apply for those. Um, Sometimes um, there aren't a lot of applications and I won't say you get it by default, but the competition isn't as high as sometimes you think, because I actually uh, I'm a judge on several and sometimes we, we really are trying to get people to apply or put other organisations forward. So do apply for those because that then helps with your credibility, helps you to open doors. And again, I know another organisation who uh, the, the, the uh, director told me that she was sat next to the high sheriff at the dinner not happening at the moment I know but this was last year she was sat next to him at the dinner and I thought well you immediately wouldn't have had that seat if you weren't going to be one of the award winners but as a result of the conversation that she had over the dinner with the high sheriff he say um, he said this is it sounds fascinating what you're doing so she used the opportunity to come and visit us and as a result of that, he then subsequently was able to introduce uh, that charity to five uh, potential major donors. And within six months, two had actually given £10,000 each. So, you, you know, this is about a strategic plan, about planning fundraising so that you're doing things that doesn't just uh, release money now or give you the opportunity to get support now it can then often lead to other things. So don't just think of things in the short term, even though possibly at the moment you're under pressure to think of things in the short term. We're gonna come back later to think about short-term wins, but also long-term gains as well. So we say lots of grant makers, um, uh, lots of trusts and foundations are supporting organizations who they've already given support to. So again, if you're looking for some quick wins and looking for some instant funding, go through your records and just check who in the past few years has supported you. 
go back to them to see if they're doing anything special to help organizations at the moment because uh, some of them have released extra funding to enable them to do that. Now, say, um, corporates you say, are a great source of funds, I, I know, to many of you, um, but you say, but from a different pot, it's not necessarily from their philanthropic one, but think of it as very much a partnership. You say, they're looking for publicity, they're looking to perhaps uh, put their name in front of new audiences. But also so many uh, different commercial organizations, companies, they, they actually want their volunteering opportunities. Now, I know I, have, I often laugh about uh, uh, why do companies think all, all that charities want is, is a room to be painted. The number of times that I've had corporates say, we'd like to come and paint a room. And you think, oh no, we just don't want another room painted. But for some, that might be the way you actually get something, uh, you know, sort of refurbished. Uh, it could be a team of volunteers who come from a corporate. Now, I was involved with a grade one listed hall um, and we actually had a few corporates we were starting to approach. And we had a fairly big company who, in the end, they, they gave um, you know, volunteering time to all their, their uh, staff. So they actually asked for a year, we we'll have a rolling program because we gave them the challenge. And this is what they, they took it up upon themselves as a challenge, not just, oh, we're doing our volunteering days. It was a challenge to actually restore the kitchen gardens. But we also said, but we've no equipment to do it um, or whatever. So they, they had to go and buy all the, the, the gardening equipment, but they then restored. And then they were so proud of this uh, at the end of it. As a company, they'd helped achieve this. But also as a result at the end, many of those volunteers who came because they were wearing their company volunteering hat when they originally came to us, they then were so enthused, loved what they'd achieved and realised, uh, as, as I know very often at, at home, you know, that once the weeds are gone, it's, they will come back again or, you know, you need to plant and then you need to harvest, you need to, uh, you know, sort of tie up and do all of those other things. So we actually found it was a great way to then actually retain an awful lot of those people who come through their company to do almost, well, I've, this is what I've been given for my Friday job. Uh, they actually, we were able to retain them because they were really very much involved. And also we retained not just some volunteers, but we retained all that fabulous gardening equipment as well. Um, just also think about the community that's out there the community in which you're part of. Things are being done different at the moment. What about your friends groups? Many friends groups have had to stop doing what they, they normally do. They're not actually able to volunteer at your properties or at where, where you're actually based. Some of those might find they can do things to help you with your fundraising because you want to sort of keep them involved. You want some level of engagement still. Uh, I know it's a different sort of organisation, but I was talking to someone earlier uh, the other day um, at the RNLI. Their friends groups have not done any of their traditional fundraising, but they thought, what could they do? because they can't stand out there giving up, uh, you know, stickers and uh, doing those events that they normally do. But they've pivoted their fundraising and phenomenally, their friends groups have actually raised £7 million over the summer. So just think about the people who are close to you already and are not able to do the volunteering that they normally would. Is there something that they could do to actually get involved in fundraising? And those fundraising groups that perhaps you've got, even though possibly they can't do their normal fundraising activities, what can they actually pivot to? They might be able to set up an eBay shop to actually help with your merchandise if you've not got an online shop. They may actually, you say, rather than running, uh, perhaps some of them might have done a car boot sale for you. Again, that could be set up. These are all virtual fundraising things. They may take on a challenge themselves. Um, I know another organisation who say it's a heritage one, but I'll not tell you which one, but they're going to do a Mount Pie Monday on the 14th. And again, it's a way just to bring everyone together. Uh, but they're saying, you know, make a donation while you have your mince pie. 
Uh, again, something else that's happening at the moment is donate the, the uh, Christmas party money as well. Lots of, of charities and organisations, uh, when, when COVID originally hit and we were in lockdown, we were actually, uh, many people were, were encouraging people to donate their commute. So hopefully, uh, I know we're all waiting for the news uh, later today as to what tier we're going to be uh, in, in, in England, at least when we come out of lockdown uh, next, next week. But obviously, you say, there's things that are, are happening around the whole of the UK into the way that we currently can mix and can't mix and obviously doing things over Christmas. So if you're not able to travel and see your family at Christmas, because you say you have far too many people outside of that th uh, three households coming together. Again, it may be a way that people want to connect through doing something for charity. So again, maybe you've got a quiz that you can share and people you know, join in as a family to, to perhaps that. Going on to earned income, and I've got it highlighted on there, or in bold, should I say, uh, because for, for many uh, heritage organisations, this is a fabulous, uh, and for, for many of you, you said, yeah, we're not earning income through tickets and whatever. Uh, but um, there's definitely one castle near Abergavenny, uh, no, not Abergavenny, Abergelly, I'm not even going to try and pronounce uh, the Welsh uh, name of that, but um, they closed, uh, I believe, at the end of August and they're closed for the rest of the year because I think they're getting some money from somewhere else. And if you go onto their website, they've got some plans about how they're doing some refurbishment. Uh, Summer Leighton Hall, that's, I say, I know it's a Lancashire accent, but I'm actually uh, in, in East Anglia where, where I primarily live now, uh, but not that a million miles away, uh, the Summer Leighton Hall, uh, that was Sandringham uh, in the Crown. So again, they, they have obviously uh, looked at getting money through that source, obviously well before COVID hit. I do remember a friend of mine at a cathedral, who was development director at a cathedral, uh, texted me one day and said, you'll never guess who's in our cloisters today. And they were part of the set for Harry Potter. Now I know some of you do uh, work with TV and film companies. But if you're not doing, is that an opportunity for you? There are agencies out there, just a quick Google search will certainly identify several uh, that you could get in touch with. But also earned income, somewhere that I went in the summer, had a huge garden um, and also an apple orchard. They normally use the apples to, to um, produce uh, different things that they had within their cafe but they were actually selling the apples. And what a great way you could buy a bag of, um, so it was obviously late summer, not the main uh, summer, they wouldn't have been ripe enough then, but you know, you could either buy a mixed bag and, and try lots of different apples, or you could actually buy, you know, a bag of different ones that you say, certainly you would never find in Tesco's, Waitrose or Morrison's or wherever you're doing your shopping or that local farm shop that might have a bit more variety, but you know, they had loads and loads of choice. What about your vegetable gardens? Again, can you actually be doing box schemes? If you've not got those uh, things up and running, is, if you've got land, is that something that you could do to actually work with volunteers? Possibly even bring in children from schools because again, lots of people wanting to do things in the outside, uh, even through the winter. So it could be um, a local sort of, you know, older people's group, um, the bedding shed scheme we've got uh, is again one of those locally and they go out doing lots of different uh, activities in the community it may be you could apply you know uh, appeal to a rotary or round table group to actually come and help uh, with some raised beds and start perhaps something like that again just some thoughts and some ideas to help you uh, trigger perhaps is there some thoughts so when we look uh, at, I uh, say, those sources of funds and then look at where income is coming to the overall voluntary and community sector, uh, this uh, is a graph that comes from um, the CAF report, uh, previous uh, one. You can then see that overall, one of the biggest sources of, of cash to the sector overall is from individuals and uh, major donors within that, 12.8 billion pounds. And tied in with individual givers is then that gift aid because uh, companies do, may have tax advantages to them for giving money, but we as 
charities don't actually see that it might be an incentive to them to actually give us the money but there's no way we can claim it back but when individuals give money we as organizations as long as we're a registered charity have the chance then to claim back and you can see there that 1.3 billion was repaid in gift aid but are you really making the most of gift aid i put that question to you because it's estimated that 585 million pounds i'm going to say that again 585 million pounds is going unclaimed in gift aid so if you're looking for a quick win we can go back four years to actually go back to donors ask them to do a gift aid declaration so this is individuals who've given to you go back four years and anything in that time can then be gift aided and just think about what you're offering now that individuals are going to is a way that individuals are going to support you obviously if they're buying apples they can't gift aid it because they're getting something back in return if they're playing a lottery or uh, they're buying a raffle ticket they can't gift aid it because they're getting their benefit back but if people are making a straight donation to you that is their cash and if they're a uk taxpayer and have paid enough uh, as to what you're going to pay uh, reclaim back from hmrc then it's eligible for gift aid so that could be a quick win and i know that at the moment the charity finance group the cfg are actually you know busy uh, campaigning and i know uh, the institute is very much involved in this as well campaigning to the government to actually get that 20% reclaim increase to 25%. So watch this space. Now, I know it's not a quick win and we're gonna come back to mention legacies, but again, I just want you to look at that figure. 2.8 billion pounds comes in from legacies. That's individuals leaving money in their will. 2.9 billion, so it's almost the equivalent from legacies, is coming from the top 300 foundations. That's the top 300 grant making trusts. But when you think there's round about 9,000 trusts registered in the UK who are grant makers, there's still an awful lot more money then coming into the sector. And I know to many, many heritage organisations, some of it is those small, very, very niche trusts, but they love what you do. They love the archaeology. They love your, your heritage site. They love uh, you know, the environment in which you're trying to restore or whatever. Uh, and then direct corporate giving, you can see uh, as the sector overall, uh, that is a, a, a relatively small amount compared to some of those other areas. But I know if this was just looking at the heritage, we couldn't find those figures anywhere just to reflect the heritage sector. But again, just think of it, much of that is coming in the form of sponsorship. So let's now just sort of think, as, as, as we could see on that last slide, 12.8 billion what are we doing to tap into that so there's so many ways that individuals can actually support you uh, many of these you might already be doing but if you're looking for new ideas just thinking what could we do could you do an adopter scheme now i know obviously we've got a uh, uh, the, the the image is of a uh, sponsor a seat uh, I don't know if uh, I should share with you, but my neighbour and I, we always do very silly Christmas presents. And if I tell you he sponsored a newt with the Suffolk Wildlife Trust the other year, it might give you an indication of what he thinks I spend my time doing over Christmas or other times. Uh, but no, so, you know, uh, uh, can you get people to adopt something uh, just for a year and, and link them? Many organisations do this. Sometimes we need to look outside the heritage sector to see what people are doing to then bring things in, but also look within the sector to see what people are doing. Adopt a seat where you've got a performance venue is, is uh, very much uh, something that I know many of you uh, tend to, to try out and, and you get support that way. But also, yeah, gifts in wills, legacies, we're going to come back to that in a minute. But also giving in memory. Um, we're in a very sort of strange time at the moment. You say very limited people can go to funerals. Uh, many people choose, instead of having flowers, even in normal pre-COVID times, chose to support a charity, a charity that's close to them. Many heritage organisations don't promote this as a chance to get involved. 
but also celebration giving. We don't need to think of it as morbid. And just because somebody's died, giving a gift isn't necessarily a morbid uh, way. It's a way to celebrate somebody's life. Uh, and again, think about setting up a tribute fund where people can use an online forum to capture memories and different things, but also use it to raise money. So they might then decide to walk the boundary of uh, your particular sort of location or even your county boundary and do it for your organisation. But they're doing it in memory of someone close to them who's unfortunately no longer with us. Individuals get involved in crowdfunding. We've got an example in a minute coming up. Major donors, membership, payroll giving, celebration giving, text giving. Uh, again, I've got a couple of examples coming up. So I want to just move on to those so I can give you some specific examples. So after this session, I want you all to just have a look at your website. What does it say? I know many heritage organisations have got a banner across at the moment saying, unfortunately, due to COVID restrictions or the current sort of tier we're in, or because of lockdown, we're currently closed. And then there's a big full stop. Why not go on and just add? So go on, go and update your website, some of you, uh, later on. And say, so, to help us be here to reopen, now, Think about donating to us. Put a, something, a, a message up there. And this, I'm just sharing this one. It's so, so clear. It's not huge techie stuff that's going on here because I know some people say, you know, it's only basic our website. We can't do lots of uh, doing online giving. But Waterloo Uncovered has got two buttons on their website that do a click through to a Just Giving page or click through to PayPal. It's so easy. So just think about, are we saying to people and giving people the opportunity, anyone who visits our website, what's the current update? What are you sharing? And are you telling them that, that you do need money to be able to be here for the future? We do need money to be able to reopen. Do you want to support us now? Put that information up there. Here with the Church's Conservation Trust, it makes it really clear what uh, they're actually asking on this page. It's very bold and there's a single giving page, but then there's options to be able to give for different campaigns, but also there's another click through that gives different amounts and frequencies in which people can actually donate. My next one here um, is uh, showing, uh, let's just close that, sorry, because we're straight onto their website. Uh, I love this image that Dorset and Rail, uh, uh, Somerset and Dorset Railway Trust have got on, on their website. It's almost, it could be the end of line there. That subliminal message that's there, I think is brilliant. I don't know if we've got anyone on the, the call from uh, that organisation. But then if we just scroll down, we can then see, you know, we're being given choices. Do we want to refurbish? Do we want to do the, the appeal for the engineering facility? Or do we want to do the appeal about bringing home the goods, which is about the overhaul of these two mineral wagons uh, together with others? So again, we can find out more and we can donate uh, directly on this page. And there's a number of ways to donate. Uh, and again, it's really clear there. We can set up a standing order uh, and, and you say click through and again, I'm loving this one and, and that's why I, another example why I've chosen it because it had definitely got download a gift aid declaration form and also then subscribe to our newsletter. So we're not just asking them to give, we're actually asking them to get in touch, but also by subscribing to their newsletter, you know, you can update them then with how their money is actually making a difference and what you as an organisation are actually achieving that possibly wouldn't have been uh, able to be done so without their help. Let's now say uh, the New Forest, New Forest Heritage Centre. Uh, again, uh, on their donate, we've got the donate button up there. So it's really clear. We go onto their website, perhaps checking out something. But again, it's really clear. And what about that? Be a heritage hero. Um, there's been so much talked about NHS heroes and yes, 
you know, there's an awful lot of key workers been doing incredible things out there. But we need heritage heroes. And I love the title of this appeal uh, so that, you know, we can run our free entry museum, gallery, world class library and ex uh, education centre only with the help of donations from, and I love this, from lovely, generous people like you. So there we are. So just think of, of the messages that we're giving out to people just in that name itself. We're definitely with that mindset. Now, let me speed on because um, I'm not going to play this now, but uh, this is Coffin Works. Again, I know uh, Vanessa is sticking stuff in the chat to you so you can have a look at this. This is a crowdfunding appeal. So just have a look and possibly get some inspiration from what they've actually been doing. And one, uh, uh, two last examples I quickly want to share. This is something that's happening uh, at Derby Museum and, and the lovely Jackie shared this with me. This is a, a wall, uh, as you can very clearly see, going up the staircase. Uh, it's a great way to remember a person or celebrate something because if you look really closely under, you know, that popping or the owl or the uh, peregrine falcon, you'll see in small letters there is somebody's name. Uh, uh, the, the, they ask for a minimum donation of £25 to name a bird for 12 months. And last year, it actually generated for them in the region of £7,000, plus then the gift aid that they were able to actually claim on that. There's great retention uh, and more than half pe of the people who have um, a, a bird carry on for an, a second year and then a third year. So it's a great way to get regular supporters. And there's lots of space for even more birds, as you can see on that staircase wall. Legacies, individuals leaving a gift in their will. It's almost the buy now, pay later model. But again, there's such synergy with heritage organisations about that lasting legacy of wanting an organisation to continue and be there well into the future. And many people don't just think it's only emotive charities, don't just think it's health related charities that people are going to die from a condition. You know, people leave money to things they care about and they're passionate about. But if you don't suggest it, whether it's on your website, whether it's in any literature or when people visit you uh, on the site, whether it's uh, posters, also share in your newsletter that, uh, and share the story of someone who's chosen to leave a gift in their will. It's such as say, uh, people are passionate and do the things they want to actually, uh, you know, see and, and get involved with in their lifetime. They then will support in their, when they're no longer here through a gift in their will. Again, I'm not going to go into lots of detail, but if you want some stats around uh, the, the projected rise of income and the rise of people, including gifts in wills to charities, there's a great report from Legacy Foresight and the analysis that they've been doing. But it predicts that charitable bequests will increase by almost a quarter in the next 10 years. So again, if you're not sharing, this is a way that people can support you, you might be missing out on that rise. We've been talking about individuals giving and about cashless giving. Do you have the opportunity for people to give by text? This is just one company donor. Uh, again, I'm not promoting them. I'm just sharing some of their data. But look at some of the stats here. The one that jumps out at me, well, there's two particularly. Over two million pound was, was donated uh, in the spring of this year through text, this text giving platform. But look at that increase, 653% increase compared to the same period last year. So just think, are you offering people the way to donate in the way that suits them? Again, pivoting your things. You say, we've not got the, the people to run a raffle. There's organisations out there, fine that they're going to take a charge, but if this is money that otherwise you wouldn't have, is this something that you could be doing at the moment? Again, not promoting anyone, just use it as an example. And so again, some of the organisations that are using that. So I've just got a couple of quick slides to, to wind up this session. So thinking, and I mentioned it a, a couple of times already, don't just think about quick wins. We need to think about long-term gains as well. 
a gift in somebody's will, they're not going to go to their solicitor, solicitor next week uh, and update their will and then die the week after and you get the money, unless it's a very unfortunate incident. But, you know, if we don't start promoting gifts in wills, if we're not already doing so, we're never going to get them. If we've not got lots of individuals supporting us, that won't necessarily be the next way on. But just think about your volunteers, your trustees, you know, can they lead by example? But also think about, you know, what is the low hanging fruit out there? So it's about some of the things that we've already shared. Going back to those funders who've already helped you, some of those grant making organisations, looking for opportunities that are natural synergy, perhaps with some companies that are out there. So you say just a couple more slides. So are you doing anything to perhaps attract uh, and get, secure support from major donors? Well, it might be just applying for that High Sheriff's Award might just be one thing that takes you that next stage further. What else are you doing through your website and in a virtual arena that enables people to give in a way that they want to now? So whilst you're putting together your thoughts, I can already hear you out there shouting, Jill, but there's only me, I can't do it all. But just analyze, this is the value of planning, just analyze and think all these things that possibly you've been jotting down or people have been suggesting to you, you can't do them all. So just then analyze and think about, yes, what might be that low hanging fruit that's low effort and high impact, but then analyze it. It makes no difference. It might be low effort, but it's low impact. So don't do it. It might be high effort, but low impact. It's definitely not worth doing. It might be high effort, but high impact. That might be something to be moving on to later. So uh, using the lovely Ansoff's matrix, uh, you know, just think about that risk element as well. So over here, we've got the least risky. There's not no risk there, but it's the least risky. But we might need to improve an existing approach. So it's an existing fundraising technique to an existing audience. And that's our least risky thing. But over here, it may be there's something that we're already doing but we can focus it at a different audience. It might be something that you've done with corporates. You've had corporate support for perhaps a new exhibition space. Possibly a Rotary group might like to think about that as an opportunity. They might be looking for new members and say, this is a great way we could invest some of our funds that we've raised, but we're supporting an organization in our community, but we're also using it to increase our profile and whatever. So these are our two intermediate risks and then our most risky is here, new techniques to new groups. Now I'm not saying don't do it, but plan it carefully, but your whole fundraising plan shouldn't be made up of this sort of last quartile over here. We want lots of these, some of these and a few of these. So I hope that has given you some thoughts and different ways that we can move forward. There's been lots I know going on in the chat um, and what we're going to do is uh, open up for the question and answer. So we'll stop that screen share. You can now see who we really are. Um, so here's Sarah, who's gonna help me with the questions because I know there's been quite a lot going on uh, and I can't manage to read everything at the same time as well as answer. Lovely. Jill, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And lots for people to go away and think about. But um, to give us as much time as possible with the questions, I'm going to jump straight in. We did ask people to submit questions in advance. So we'll be doing a mixture of the ones um, that are coming in live now and also some of the ones that were submitted um, as people were signing up. So first question. Lots of organisations, heritage organisations, don't have dedicated fundraising staff. So how do you encourage all staff to actively support fundraising activities rather than seeing it as kind of something separate and one removed from what they do? Well I'm a huge believer and I know it sounds a bit trite at times but everyone in an organisation is both a fundraiser and a service provider. Mm. There is that lovely song in Cabaret, Money Makes the World Go Around. So I think to actually everyone have the responsibility to actually generate funds as one aspect but when you think, you say, someone who practices an education officer, 
they're helping the fundraising process by gathering data. Who are the people who are coming using those services? What stories do they hear? What comments? And actually, you know, being able to feed that in to perhaps, you know, a grant application. So this is where everyone across the organisation should actually take on sort of perhaps different uh, aspects. If there's no official fundraiser, then to actually think how to share it up. But on every team meeting, is, is income generation should be there. And shall we suggest it's at the top of the agenda rather than the bottom of the agenda? Because we always run out of time and it almost puts the sort of fundraising down at the bottom. But uh, it is this catch 22, which comes first, chicken or egg? Well, you can't ask for money if you've not got something to share with people and, and what uh, people's money will do. But you can't do all those fabulous things if you've not got the money to do it. But also think about the volunteers who are involved um, and obviously trustees and your board are, are a special sort of volunteer. But again, some of those might have contacts. I was just sharing before an example. So thinking about uh, having some exhibition space, perhaps instead of it being sponsored by a corporate, it might be by a round table or a rotary. It might be a volunteer is part of the local round table or rotary. It could well be a volunteer, their mom or their sister or their, you know, their son works at a company so they could actually help open the door. So when we say about everyone being involved in fundraising, it doesn't necessarily mean they've all got to stand with a, a collection can, but it's about sharing the news about what the organization's doing, but also the fact it needs money. And that way it may be, you say, they get nominated for charity of the years in, in companies, but also for those trusts who then like to pick their own organisations to support, just sharing around the information that your organisation is doing incredible things, but it does need more money to be able to carry on doing it. And um, you mentioned there about, about special volunteers, your board of trustees, and we do actually have a question from somebody asking about how you encourage your board to buy into fundraising so that staff are given time to do it and how you get that confidence with your board um, to undertake the task of fundraising. Well, again, trustees can get involved at all sorts of different levels. It's back to understanding what particular skills and qualities and connections uh, that uh, trustees have. Now, trustees can play a, a really important role um, in major giving um, and, and talking to high net worth individuals. Now, I know, again, I've got people, I'm sure, screaming out at me saying, but our trustees, Jill, aren't like that. They're not well connected. But there's other things that they can do. They may themselves be able to sit down and write a trust application. They may be able to introduce you to other people through their own networks who could actually help. They could lead by example, uh, as I mentioned before about legacies. Um, we, we, sharing stories is, is a great way to communicate about the value of the organisation and there's lots of stories we can tell and so often it's about someone who's used our services, that's great, but also in heritage organisations there's so many other stories, you know, stories about the people who use your organisation uh, in the past uh, with that coffee works, there's some great stuff on, on that video. But also it could be they, they actually uh, uh, capture stories, um, but they, they may also then be a story in themselves to actually then help recruit other volunteers or if they've actually included uh, the charity, your organisation, the, the heritage organisation in their will, then that is a great story to share. And, and that's a really very proactive way of actually uh, recruiting uh, people to think about becoming a legator to your charity is by actually uh, sharing a story about someone who's already done it. There's no point uh, you know, a chief exec or a director or even the fundraiser saying, you know, why don't you leave us a, a gift in your will? It sounds a bit biased, but you say that would be a great way that trustees could, could get involved. Lead from the front. And it doesn't have to be huge amounts. That's why you say the word legacy is sometimes not used because research says that people who, who think about a legacy, they think it's got to be lots of money. It might be, you know, a hundredth of, of somebody's estate but they've committed to supporting it. But yeah, it's about sharing and talking to people on behalf of the organisation. And so if you 
you know at the moment we're, we're, we're not doing many face-to-face -face meetings but again i know lots of heritage organizations there's lots of outside space it may be some trusts will come to visit but again it can be just add credibility if there's a trustee actually at one of those visits or he's on a zoom call with a trust who wants to find out some more or possibly a corporate who wants to get involved but to actually say have, have one of your trustees who's uh, is a perhaps known in, in a, a community as well that can actually add those things as well that's really useful thank you so we've got a question here about specifically kind of as we know that the COVID-19 ongoing crisis has impacted people's ability to um, fundraise we've got somebody asking specifically about a capital appeal at present I'm wondering whether now's the right time to pause um, and and reopen that appeal when times are more certain or do they keep going yeah, that's a really <laughs> quite close to the heart that one because uh, when COVID hit I was actually working, uh, I do interim uh, roles as well, and I was actually working on a capital appeal myself. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting one um, and I think each organisation has to assess and decide what's appropriate for them. In the situation I was in, uh, originally the, the appeal was put on hold because uh, it was a refurbishment and an extension of something uh, and then in the end um, they decided uh, subsequently with uh, a big sort of trustee extraordinary trustee meeting um, and as a chief exec and myself involved and in the end they've made the decision to actually stop they have <laughs> We were 65% to target and we've got so many things lined up. It, we were going to, uh, building work was supposed to have actually started in March this year. And, and we actually, I was quite confident we were going to move it probably to, to round about now um, because we were going great guns. But they have decided because it was an extension and the extra revenue that that was going to require them to find over and above their existing requirement levels, they have said we've got enough money to do our refurb so what we're going to do is be sensible a very cautious board very risk averse and they said we're just going to do the refurbishment however it's back to what is the purpose for the capital appeal can you not get people on site at the moment so this is why uh, and it's not me sitting on the fence it really is a case-by-case -case basis now, maybe that's one of the people who wants to register for a discussion, uh, you know, for, for one of those one to one sessions. You know, we can really get into it. Uh, but as I say, in terms of giving overall general advice, I can't say, rock on with it, crack on, there's great opportunities. And there are still opportunities out there. Uh, so for some organisations, this is the right thing to do. And again, I, I, I'm involved in lots of capital appeals and, and hear about them uh, around the place. I do the, the Institute's training for capital appeal fundraising at the Chartered Institute of Fundraising. And, I still t and there's still people coming on those courses because they are still doing them. But is there, it is a case by case basis. What do you want to achieve by doing this? Will it actually sort of extend and further your aims and objectives or is it caution and we'll put it on hold for 12 months and then recommence? So there's, there's different ways. And I just just so that for anybody who missed it at the beginning of the session, I mentioned the fact that we are as of 8 a.m. this morning, we are open for applications on the Rebuilding Heritage one to one and group support. So you can access uh, the application form from the link in the chat that has just been dropped in right this second. And you can apply all the way through until 11 p.m. on the 16th of December. And one of the types of consultancy support that we can offer is access to expert fundraising advice. Um, so, yes, I think you're absolutely right, Jill, that on some of those some of the questions we're getting through there's some specifics to consider that um really come to us and apply <laughs> um so we've also got a question um from somebody who submitted this in advance saying that they've previously relied on events to engage with donors and um, what can they do instead now uh, because they cannot hold events and won't be able to for some time to come and somebody did mention in the chat that they've had a lot of success engaging with donors via zoom so Jill, do you have any other suggestions for everybody? But, but definitely, there is, a, there is this thing about, um, which was a growing trend before uh, COVID, is, is do it yourself. Do your own thing. You know, again, 
we, we, you know, look outside the sector as well as inside the sector. But, you know, uh, comic, uh, not comic really, Children in Need happened the other Friday. And a lot of that is about individuals doing their own fundraising, putting together their own event. So whilst you physically might not be able to bring people together, you know, for, for more wine and carol singing, perhaps. But could you do it online? Just so much, many of us. Again, we, we uh, uh, here on a Friday night at, at eight o'clock, we, we do a Zoom call, a group of friends of us. We do the gin and tonic eight, eight o'clock hour. Um, some might want to start it a bit sooner, depending on what Friday, what week we've had. But, you know, lots of people are just getting used to sort of uh, moving it around. Um, but to say, many people are doing their own activities. You know, just think about Captain T uh, Sir Captain Tom. We better put his full title in. You know, he started something that has then, within these COVID times, has, has become quite a trend. So many people couldn't do the London Marathon. It got, uh, you know, pivoted to the 2.6 challenge in the spring. But even when they thought it was going to rehappen in, in the, the, the autumn, in October, it was only the elite runners. But many people then ran their own marathon in their own area. So again, just have a look at those sorts of things and say, can we encourage people uh, to do something, their own activity in a virtual world, but share it? Uh, and, and share on, on Just Giving, on Facebook, uh, and there's lots of different things that people, those runners who are out there, they can link, uh, you know, different devices to their Just Giving page and, and, and Facebook and whatever. So yeah, just think about doing some things together online uh, and people are still enjoying that and I'm hearing loads of things. Behind the scenes tours, again, what, what lots of fundraising are about is about keeping people engaged. We want to engage with them, then we want to ask them, then we want to update them. And what a great way to update. You know, what is your site? It's closed at the moment, but what or not, you know, um, you know, six o'clock, uh, eight, eight o'clock on Friday night, do a virtual tour. Obviously it's been recorded in advance, but you know, or even on a Saturday, you know, do a virtual tour, show what's happening. Again, there may be wildlife about that people aren't getting to see. So again, you know, put some stuff on your website, but also have some time when people can join you and they can have that interaction with you as officials and people from the organisation, but also meet other people who like themselves are passionate about your organisation. So it's a way to attract new supporters, but it's your way to retain your existing supporters. Companies love it as well. You know, that's something you can do with a company. You could do a quiz about your organisation that could be shared with one of your co corporate supporters. You know, lots of you got some incredible facts and figures. Um, and again, for people who are regularly coming, why not go and take some photos? Uh, in, a, in our village quiz, we're doing an online village quiz where I live. But again, we've got a guy who's a brilliant photographer and we have the photo round you know where is this in the village you know and you'll get a little tiny bit and you've got to name that place so again you know what about doing that within your organization and doing that as a quiz and because you mentioned jill you you brought in the kind of corporate side of things and companies there we have got a question from somebody who's saying they've, they've really struggled with corporate sponsorship in the past and wondering whether you have any top tips for putting together a sponsorship toolkit um what things that um staff and volunteers might need to know who are new to the concept well the first thing is to go back to that basic principle it's a partnership they want something you want something so why not as a starting point if, if you're targeting a particular company find out what they do to promote and advertise themselves and then do some research about the costs of that so possibly it sounds like you're, you're all joining me in my village but you know we have a village newsletter <laughs> perhaps with the letterbox but what's the cost we have some people you know do, do a, a quarter page some do a full page but again, you know, we've got the East Anglian Daily Post. Do people actually advertise in that? What's the, 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 the advertising rate for that? Are they actually, you know, what are the Google ads that they're doing? Is that how they're promoting themselves? So look at the company that you're targeting. And it has to be on a, not one size fits all. It has to be tailored. That's another quick tip. But also to, to then see what are they doing to promote themselves? And how much does that cost? Because you're getting an idea what sort of spend they've got. And then 
undercutting it but also think then about what is the reach what's the what benefits are they going to get back from being involved are you are they going to get their name on your website are they going to have a click through from your website to their website um you know how how big is the logo the member sponsorship then does actually start to attract VAT as well because of the benefits back that are quite tangible uh, to, to that company. So understand what it is that you as an organisation have got and what might be attractive to a corporate supporter. Don't undersell. And if you go in at a certain level saying these are the benefits for this level of support, if they knock you down in price because that is basically what at the end it's a sales negotiation they knock you down in price you knock them down in benefits okay so don't give things away too cheaply which i know is difficult when people are absolutely desperate oh we you know this this could be you know really so are they the prime sponsor it may be are they the headline sponsor are they the only sponsor they may be the headline sponsor, but you might have two or three others. So again, there's a price then associated be, by being the only sponsor attached to something as well, because they're not having to share that with somebody else. No, I think that's really interesting. You you said you picked up a word there. You said about tangible something being tangible, and it's it's occurred to me we do have several people putting in questions about what can heritage organizations do when they don't have a kind of they're not site-based they don't have a collection they've got nothing tangible to promote they're centered around either a profession or um they're kind of an awareness raising organization so what can they do what what sorts of things can they pull on to promote themselves and fundraise well again whilst you say there's nothing tangible in a place to go to that there's things that, that they have that have a value so again it may be you have a newsletter that goes out to everyone that might not be a physical newsletter it might be an e-news lots of stuff is that there's lots of people wanted to move electronically before and, and weren't doing it um uh, but this has forced the pace but the, the thing is um there still is a value in having that 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 paper the hard copy because it hangs around uh, it gets passed on i know people can forward a newsletter uh, an e-news uh, letter uh, an electronic one but you say that there's sometimes not that sort of stickability effect or what we often refer to as the mantelpiece effect does it sort of hang around in that pile of things uh, when stuff comes through my letterbox there's the immediate straight to the recycle there's the immediate i need to do something about this and then it gets shoved on the on the carver chair at the end of my dining room table this pile of things that i'm going to come back to later my national trust newsletter is always in that pile as well as several other things but the things that i do want to physically sit and hold and read and look through but again you know but we've got uh, many organizations have a membership base or a supporter base so again there's tangibility in the numbers of those people there's the profile of those people so again understanding who your volunteers are who your supporters are as individuals but also companies lots of stuff's done business to business so again we might have a corporate membership scheme and it's almost like gosh you know we don't want to be left out because again you might be a page on a website so again whilst it's not this physical thing there's some tangible things are being associated to you because of the website hope that covers some of those points brilliant i just wanted to take the opportunity to just address a couple of things that are coming up in the chat one is that rebuilding heritage is a uk wide program so if you are from northern ireland wales or scotland and you're wondering whether or not you can apply absolutely yes you can and um, glennis is with us today from the chartered institute of fundraising and she has just dropped into the chat a link to seven live workshops that were delivered by the uh, chartered institute and the youtube link through to those and for people asking about whether all these links will be made available afterwards Yes, when we upload the recording from today, we will make sure to include the links on the web page as well. So getting back to questions, we've had a question from somebody saying, obviously fundraising is a, is a time consuming activity. So if you have limited time, where do you think, what, what do you think is the best place to invest that time? Yeah, this comes up so often. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back to that, those low hanging fruit. Um, so being really really honest um you know uh, I, I would try and do a few things don't just put all your eggs in one basket 
I think one thing that you want to do is is respect and look after your existing supporters, your volunteers. And when I say supporters, I mean anyone who's giving you money or time, goods or anything, anyone who's supporting your organisation. Find ways to reconnect with those because, uh, you know, again, to give it its, its real jargony term is stewardship. Um, but we need to look after and keep them close to us. We might not be raising money from them now. And I know for some people say, I want money, I want money. So I'm not doing all that, <laughs> that nice to do stuff. But can I just assure you, do it because again it may be they've just decided at christmas we, we as a family we've decided at christmas we can't see most of our family uh, i hate sending parcels in the post because it costs money and i'd rather put it to the gift but everyone's saying we don't need anything at the moment and we've all decided to make gifts to charities so again if you're keeping connected with people again you know people are perhaps not going to send christmas cards or you say uh, not have an office party uh, or do something, uh, uh, perhaps a, a party at home that they normally would do. So if we're not connecting to the people and organisations who already support us, we're missing some of that low hanging fruit. We're not doing it necessarily. We want to keep in touch. We need to be polite. I always say fundraising is about ask nicely and make sure you thank and thank and thank again. But keep them informed by telling them what's going on. It, and what, without technically asking them, you're just updating them, keeping them informed and just tell them where you are up to with your fundraising. It might generate another donation from them. So, so that's a, an important area to invest some time. But then the other thing is look at what has been successful for you in the past uh, and, and perhaps, you know, look at those areas. Can we do more of the same to uh, uh, people? But also then if you're really looking for, for, for some new money and some cash, just have a look at all those grant making bodies that are out there who've got special COVID programmes. They're still out there. I know some have come to an end, some are going into a second phase. And even though, and, and again, most of you, again, I can hear some of the people saying, but, but we're not frontline. There's lots of money sort of out there because many sort of uh, organisations who are grant makers recognise that even if you're not frontline, so many organisations that are vital, absolutely vital across the whole of the UK to be here for when people can go out and about, for mental health, for well-being, for enjoyment, for, for developing people, <laughs> they want them to be there. So even though you've not, you're not delivering frontline services, uh, share with them how you've been affected. And that's one of the key things to do is, is share how uh, you've been affected by the, the, the current pandemic and what it's resulted in uh, uh, and how possibly you've changed your services as well. And I think for me, one of the things that you mentioned earlier that I thought was such a key point as a takeaway for everybody after this session is go and look at the homepage of your website. If you've got a banner that says we're currently closed for COVID, make sure that banner says, and here's how you can donate. And that messaging around, you want us to still be here when, you know, when we can reopen, please donate if you can. I think those sorts of those kind of quick wins, um, because it doesn't take long to set up a Just Giving page, and it is something that one person can lead on within an organisation. Um, so I think if you're looking for those kind of, as you said, Jill, it's not a replacement for um, a plan, and it's not a replacement for that mixed um, income streams that you were talking about, but it is something that everybody can do. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and just keep talking to people, sharing information, sharing stories, and then, and you know, we're still short on money, you know, share that, but also share the difference that you've been making to people uh, and, and, and people's lives. Um, and, and, and then just say, and we've been able to do this because of our generous supporters. Some of them at the moment can't help us. So is there a way that you can actually replace their support? So a question that came in in advance of this session was about fundraising for project work, because some of the projects that people have been fundraising for pre-COVID are now paused. So how do they address that issue of continuing to fundraising, fundraise for something that has now changed because it wasn't what they were originally fundraising for? And how do they balance that in terms of the fact that some people who've already donated, donated to something that was quite different to what is now being delivered? 
and I think that's a really interesting one, Sarah, uh, and to, to, to really just spend a few minutes talking about, because um, I think at the moment, so many funders recognise that things aren't happening in the way that they were doing, whether it's a corporate, whether it's an individual, whether it's a grant maker. And I think it's about going back and, and really unravelling what it's all about. And I often think the situation A, we're here, we want to get to situation B, and this is here. And there's a journey that we're going to take. And that is then the project, is the link between the two. And we've chosen to, to do one thing, and that's what we've asked for the money for, to do it in a certain way. But in a way, what we're actually asking for, to do is take situation A and turn it into a situation B. And it's just sharing, we're doing it a different way. So just go back to, this is what we wanted to get to. This is the situation that's far from ideal at the moment, whether that is, you know, those, uh, those lovely goods <laughs> wagons, <laughs> you know, when we were looking at the Somerset and Dorset Railway before, you know, uh, and, and we, we thought we'd do it as an apprenticeship scheme and, and, and engineering apprenticeships would come to, in a way, the journey, how are you going to do it is a means to an end. And I actually say, it's of no interest to anyone other than you. Sometimes a grant maker will, will ask, have you got a project plan? Can you share us some of that? And they just wanted to know that, yes, actually, if they do that, it'll take situation A and turn it into situation B. But the process is, is actually usually often the boring bit. And if we spend too much time communicating about the boring bit, we turn people off. We want to share this situation A and inspire them by saying, you can make situation B come about. Well, I know that sounds really patronising, but, but at the end of the day, it's, it's just getting people. And, and that's the, the other key thing. Can I just share as well is don't say give us your money and we'll do this incredible thing of changing A to B. In our messaging, your donation will change the way that we're doing something or that will change the people, uh, people's understanding of what happened in the mill workers lifetime or whatever. So it's about enthusing them and connecting them directly, donor to beneficiary. And I mean, just from my own experience of working on projects, even without the COVID pandemic, I've never known a project run exactly as you predicted in a funding bid or an outline. So I think that grant giving bodies and funders are used to people coming back to them and saying, this is what we thought would happen. This is now what's actually happening and you can submit formal change requests you can stay up to date with your grant officer there's lots of ways that um they grant giving bodies actually make it very easy for you to keep them informed um, and i also just wanted to finally reflect on the the point that you made about making it clear to people that they're helping you to do something amazing because i think we all of us can get a bit uncomfortable about asking for money and actually reframing it as this is an opportunity to build a partnership and be involved in something incredible is is a really good takeaway from today's session so jill i'm I, even for, for me that was such a lovely new way for me to be thinking about fundraising so thank you so much and well, there's so much passion there let me just let me just add this one oh, sarah i'm sorry to interrupt but there is so much passion there if you're not passionate about your organization you're in the wrong organization so find out what you do find out the difference that you're making to, to people and really understand what it's all about and if you're then passionate i actually say how can you not actually ask people to be part of this so don't think oh i'm really embarrassed and grovel i'm also a great believer in self-fulfilling prophecy so if you go groveling and, and, and think as well oh they're gonna say no they're bound to say no guess what they're gonna say no because you're actually giving off these vibes so be confident and positive and just think you're giving them this incredible opportunity to be part of your fabulous organization i love that as a way of thinking about it thank you so much jill for your time today it's been absolutely incredible and i hope that everybody who's attended today's session has found it useful please do look out for the feedback form that will pop up after the session it will also be emailed to you after the event and we would really appreciate if you could complete it as it will help us to plan future training and support on the program and finally just one final reminder that applications are open for the rebuilding heritage one-to-one -one and group support and the deadline is 11 p.m on the 16th of december and you can find out all about it at www.rebuildingheritage.org.uk. Thank you and have a lovely afternoon.
Bye from me too.